continued operation. Continued. Here, get rid of this. We got it. Got it. Of the terminal. Um, and want to go out of our way to support and help the city officials and work with our government, city, state, county, um, and federal on a, quantifying the risks associated with an import export terminal uh, exporting fossil fuels or biofuels or other highly flammable liquids within a major metropolitan area with, on a liquefaction zone and adjacent to the Willamette River. Full disclosure in all cases. Okay, who is Zenith Energy? The key component is the parent company, it, they disclosed this when they made the acquisition of the terminal, is they are a privately owned international, they say midstream, but they have upstream and downstream and midstream with nine subsidiaries. The company in Houston, which is, which is the parent company of the Zenith terminal, is one of those nine entities. They have 26 midstream gas and oil, some are LNG export terminals, some are oil export terminals on the East Coast, in the Gulf of Mexico, and one in California and in Oregon. They have, with 26 midstream operations, 45 employees. That in itself is a red flag. What that tells you is this is a marginal operation, okay? And we have marginal operations, that several flags go off. One, do they have the financial resources to address a major incident? And two, did they have the technical capabilities? Financial information done in Bradstreet. This is as of um, March of this year. Revenue, 34.9 million. Now, if you look at earnings, I would say the earnings would be lucky to be one to $2 million for this year. Negative uh, outlook, B minus is not a stellar credit rating. This is not a Chevron or Exxon. This is a subsidiary that's an LLC that can pack up the tent and leave, there is a spill. All right, <clears throat> two slides we have here on the left, image from the street, which you've seen, and of course the other is the aerial view. And you will look at the actual terminals here. These are the Chevron, uh, Chevron terminals, and you'll notice, although different sizes, they each have berms. These are the tanks that we have over here on the fuel side, and this is the rail line of Zenith. So Zenith comes from here, over to here. There are a lot of small tanks and they're crammed together. That increases the, from my standpoint, the risk because if a fire starts and they're close together, it can, the term I would use is daisy, daisy chain that explosion and you'll see a series of repeating explosions and fires continue throughout the plant. Oops, sorry. Uh, here's the history. Zenith Oil, obviously from uh, 2017, acquiring Arc Logistics, increased the terminal uh, from the oil transport initially from Canada. We cited previous sites, and there are more sightings as you're well aware of as well. Storage capacity, 63.7 million gallons, which excludes the capacity in the rail cars. Now, when you talk about the rail cars, particularly coming in here, when we're talking about any type of seismic activity, those rail cars are very unstable and they are very easy to tip. So that's another aspect when we talk about any sort of seismic activity. What is earthquake liquefaction? It occurs when there's loosely packed water saturated sediments, typically clay. That's the problem. The clay will hold that water. Uh, strong ground shaking from an earthquake, aftershock, or even an explosion uh, can trigger major damage to structures. The earthquake liquefaction zone, which I'm sure you've seen this map many times. Here's the Zenith terminal. The red and scarlet areas are the high and very high risk areas, obviously right next to our Willamette River. This is an example in Japan, which was a 7.5, but it's important to recognize these buildings that we see that are tipped over like the Lego blocks are all on substantial structures. So an oil tank, fill or empty, will not take, will not need much to rupture it or to cause it to fracture. So that's very important to recognize that this is not a major structure like these Japanese buildings that fell over with the 7.5. It's gonna depend on where the epicenter is, both aerially and vertically, how deep down is the epicenter as well as the magnitude as well. Tar sands, 
The important factor about this first aspect is they started their ex exports of tar sands. There are three tar sands operations in Alberta. The extraction and the transportation costs between 18 and 19 range from 56 to $68 a barrel. Zenith stopped exporting around 2019 and that's when there was no longer an economic market. So that's when they started to look at other opportunities. And that's when they shifted to Bakken. And again, the extraction and rail transport cost when it dropped below the economic window uh, in May of 2020, they stopped that down or shut that down. Oil is May of this year rebounded to 71. It is now high 70s, low 80s. It is projected by JP Morgan, Bank of America, BP to be high 90s to low 100s by this time next year. The higher the cost, the more the incentive for them to ship and increase the ship and transport of fuel. Biofuel, if you look at the sales price, you can see this is why they shifted. They're talking about biofuel. It has nothing to do with the desire to go uh, green energy. It has to do with the margins. The margins are here. They're not, uh, or the greater margins are here. The biofuels, by the way, typically will come from coal, corn. So you'll see transportation from uh, biofuel plants out and uh, facilities out of Kansas, out of Iowa, uh, Nebraska. Those are common sources for biofuel. Tar sands, obviously, it's heavier than water. Open pit mines, there are some subsurface as well, but they all use stem, steam to stimulate. It's called dill bit because it's a diluted bitumen. A common dilutant is benzene, which is a carcinogen. And that is extremely concerning if you talk about getting into the, to, uh, our water or the uh, groundwater. Transport to, uh, is, all this is transported to the terminal by rail. This is a common ground graph that we see coming down from Canada to Montana and then Iowa, Idaho and then um, Oregon. Here's an example of Kalamazoo uh, spill, 2010. It was about 1 million gallons. It was from a pipeline. You can see the containment booms uh, up here. The main thing is 70% of the bitumen sank because of course bitumen is heavier than uh, water. <clears throat> it was contained, um, but it was, the re entire river was closed for two solid years. It was partially closed for another three to four years. The actual spill number uh, for cleanup uh, is now approaching $2 billion. This was a 2014 number. So obviously it was associated with dredging uh, and it was actually funded by the Canadian pipeline company that had the rupture. And of course, we're not talking 1 million gallons, we're talking 63 times that size. All right, Bakken oil, light crude, flashpoint, this thing will burn or explode when you, as long as you're above minus 31 Fahrenheit. So highly flammable. It also contains H2S, mercury, and arsenic. Extracted from what we would call uh, light type oil reservoirs or fracking. Pipeline and rail car. More and more pipelines because there's a limited uh, high demand for in the refineries for the oil. They are being very choosy about what oils they'll let in. So anything with high contaminants or uh, components like paraffin, which cause buildup in the pipeline, they will reject it. They're becoming choosier because the refineries that they want to get to in the mid, uh, in the Great Plains states, down and also down in Oklahoma and Texas, uh, don't want to pay uh, the additional cost for the transport of the oil. So they'll go forces them to use rail. Now forces them to use rail because rail is four or five times more expensive than pipeline. This uh, little graph picture here just simply shows the rail transport coming from South Dakota. Also there's uh, Bakken in Montana and Saskatchewan coming into Washington, Oregon. Example of North Dakota, this is just one unfortunately of many. Um, these are because of the Light tide oil operations in North Dakota, one of many uh, spills. This is only 500,000 gallons. Um, obviously, the biggest concern to me was the water table. Cleanup took five years because it was a small company and it was underfunded. 
that also is another concern where you've got a small underfunded company, their ability to respond financially and operationally is limited. So not 500,000, 63.7 million. This is the one that's perhaps uh, worst case scenario. And this is the one I think we should really be concerned about. The Bakken oil rail car derailment in 2013, 2 million gallons, 47 people were incinerated. They couldn't find the bodies. They had to identify it from the remains with DNA. 2,000 foot blast radius. This was the photo of the fire it was taken 48 hours after the initial explosion. 26,000, even though most of the fuel was consumed in the fire and the explosion, still 26,000 gallons spilled into the river. 200 million for cleanup for the uh, contaminated water. 2.7 to rebuild the city. And of course, not 2.03, 63.7. Biofuels, obviously fuel made from sugar and plant materials. Corn is a common uh, component. Also, you'll see the biofuels diluted with different types of gasoline to, or to generate a biodiesel. Highly flammable, groundwater pollutant, highly toxic to marine life. Example in Iowa, 2009, 50,000 gallons. Spill extended 42 miles. Of course, it's not lighter than water, so it mixes with water, but that said, there still was fires on the river for 42 miles. 58,000 fish were dead. A lot of sturgeon, which is why the damages just for the dead fish was 10.1 million. And 50,000 gallons versus 63.7 million gallons. All right, risks. It's in a major metropolitan area, located in an earthquake liquefaction zone. Fuel capacity is significantly greater than the analog disasters we've seen so far. Fuel storage and rail car proximity to the Willamette River. Contrast, and I think this is the, perhaps the one that I would feel is the most important to look at, if we look at the fuel spill, let's say of the Dilbit, the bitumen, 1 million gallons, and see the damage that was created, now assume just 10% of the capacity spills into the river. And think of that order of magnitude of damage, then assume 50% from that standpoint. Volatile oil bucket, 2 million gallons, and the fire and the explosion. That explosion is basically half a square mile Everything in a half a square mile was leveled and everything was incinerated. Now you start to increase the volume of that oil from that, uh, then you start to see a much greater potential risk for life and of, obviously for the, the, the river. Biofuel, 50,000 gallons, 42 miles spill. Now, as a result of this spill, the biofuel spill, the EPA said they were going to initiate additional research on what their greater concerns they have with ethanol is the water table. Uh, because it is, it can uh, mingle with the water or commingle with the water. And so they're concerned that the contamination for the water table could be greater from ethanol than even something like oil or even uh, diluted bitumen. Operations, obviously a range of uh, uh, outcomes that could happen, fuel uh, tank accident, Terminal fire explosion and spill, rail car tanker derailment, earthquake liquefaction, uh, terminal destruction, environmentals to the risk, contamination of the water table and farmlands. When we talk about spills going 10, 20, 40 miles, and we're talking about the entire farmlands, farms that are set up on Soviet Island, contamination of the water table. Also, we've got to recognize when we talk about uh, contamination, we're talking about introducing carcinogens into the water table. River ecosystem destroyed for tens of miles. Willamette River potentially closed for years, and that would mean a negative impact, obviously, to the Port of Houston. Zenith Energy fire and explosion, toxic smoke and fires, blast radius 2,000 feet or greater, fatalities, serious injuries, destruction of building and infrastructure. Zenith Energy Terminal Holdings is one of 21 members of Clean River Cooperative. It is the most recent member. 
which is a nonprofit spill response organization. Cooperative was founded in 1971. I talked with DEQ. They speak highly of them. The spill response contractor, NRC, is well established around the world. They're the largest commercial uh, spill response company. They handle spills, high hazard emergency, environmental, industrial, firefighting. So the organization is very good. However, Clean River Cooperative is set up for the Pacific Northwest from a historical look back, not from today forward. So again, when I talk about the NRC, very well respected by the DEQ and the US Coast Guard, both in the Gulf of Mexico, in Alaska and the West Coast. The question is, is Clean River Cooperative prepared for a major fire and explosion at a facility like Zenith Oil Terminal? That's to me a fundamental question you've got to ask. Well, their manual, they talk about equipment appropriate for operating on the Columbia River, which is good because obviously the re-equipment you need for the Gulf of Mexico or Alaska is different than the Columbia River. CRC planning was used to create a technical manual. So they've developed a manual and they have equipment based on their independent studies from a range of type of spills, which is the right thing to do, absolutely. However, their worst case scenario, this is in their webpage, is 300,000 barrels, 12.6 million gallons. Zenith Energy is 63.8, and they want to increase that terminal capacity. So that tells you they are currently set up for a worst case spill response plan that's less than 20% of Zenith Oil Terminal's total capacity. And that will be even less if Zenith is allowed to increase their capacity another 500,000 barrels, as they have stated they want to do. So, the risk here, it's like, the, it's like if you look back at the case study of the Valdez oil spill, the lesson learned from that, what Exxon, the problem Exxon had was, it was a pilot uh, captain error in the way of the collision, but the real problem with Exxon and slow response was the authority for limitation to call out the spill response equipment was not with the local office. It had to go all the way back to Las Colinas, Texas. And that, chain basically delayed a reaction of seven to 10 days, which meant the equipment didn't actually get out to the spill that they needed for another three weeks. And three weeks on a spill, particularly an oil spill, can be absolutely devastating to the ecosystem and the wildlife. Federal government agencies, again, this is just as we uh, discussed initially, this are agencies primarily, what I would call the main agencies dealing with uh, onshore plant storage facilities. Again, the state has, can increase the standards of the Fed. The county can increase the standards for the state. The city can increase the standards for the county, but they can't reduce them. So city of Portland can increase federal, state, or county uh, standards for the Zenith Oil Terminal because it's in your jurisdiction. But of course, you would want to do that in collaboration with the county, understand. All right, the fuel terminal. These are recommendations that we're talking about. Fuel terminals over 1,320 gallon capacity in an earthquake liquefaction zone. That number, 1,320, is a number that I found repeatedly in US EPA fuel storage regulation and guides relative to what is, I'll call it critical mass, for storage of fuel that uh, you would say when you go over this and you've got to implement regulations for something that gets highly flammable. So one, we would say post a bond to cover any potential environmental incident. I think that's absolutely essential for companies like uh, Zenith, which may have limited financial capabilities. Build earthen berms with liners for each fuel tank greater than 50 thousand, uh, gallons as per US EPA standards. These are their recommended standards that are put in their reference to berms. And you'll see actually the Chevron have berms around their fuel tanks, although there are three large tanks that each have berms and there's spacing based on that as well to mitigate the risk. Confirm access to spill response equipment and personnel to respond to 100% of the site's fuel storage capacity. 
That to me is absolutely something that's essential. What's happened is Zenith Oil has come in and, and tagged on to the response organization. That's credible. But I'm not sure the response organization fully appreciates the magnitude of the uh, capacity of the storage of the, uh, that they have. I doubt that any other company has over uh, the magnitude of Zenith Oil, or at least we haven't been able to find them. But this includes skimmers, sorbents, containment booms, flotation devices, below water skirts are very important. Fuel terminals over 12.6 million gallons. Where did that come from? That actually is the current limitation of fuel response equipment of the spill response company. Um, post a dollar a gallon for all fuel exported on the Willamette River for resale. And that we would actually recommend that be put in a environmental remediation account. Now, when the spill response company can increase their capability, two things will come. They'll either increase their capabilities, in which case the rate for all the other 21 or 20 companies and Zenith will go up because they'll have to have more boats and more skimmers and more booms, or they will expel them. So either way, export, when we're talking about this kind of volume, we wanna make sure that there's a spill response organization in place that can address the type of fuel storage that you have right now. Provide Portland Fire and Rescue a monthly report on fuels in each storage tank. Now, this is important because if you've got a company like Zenith that's talking about, well, we may want biodiesel, we want to dilute it with gasoline, or we may want to ship back the oil, or if you're calling a mixing and matching, if you're talking about putting out a fuel fire, it is critical you know what kind of fuel you've got in the tanks and where they are, because that will dictate the type of response you have there. Fortunately, the city of Portland doesn't have to deal with the type of refinery fires the city of Houston does. Okay, but that in many ways that makes it worse because when I have talked to uh, the fire bureau, uh, the city of Portland fire bureau, they have one person that handles uh, the chemical explosive or shall we say highly toxic or chemicals. Uh, and he knew Zenith was there, but he was not up to date with what they had. So it's important it needs to be on the fire bureau's radar screen and the fire bureau needs to be informed of what chemicals they have there so they can address it. You don't wanna send out there a fire truck and all of a sudden start spraying water if you've got, you've got certain chemicals out there. That would put even more people at risk, including the fire, firemen. So currently the, the facility has capacity for 63.8. Fuel tanks are within a major city. Fuel tanks are only a few hundred feet from the Willamette River. Fuel spill or biodiesel would devastate the ecosystem, farms, and the groundwater. Fuel spill or biodiesel would cause the river to potentially be closed for environmental remediation. Facilities located in a densely populated metropolitan area, an explosion of fire would cause numerous fatalities and or serious injuries. Facilities on an earthquake liquid vacuum zone. Um, spill response contractor. Obviously, it's very well respected, but looks like their worst case planning scenario is not up to the potential impact of a Zenith oil spill. Zenith Energy has insufficient financial resources to fund a multi million, let alone a multi billion dollar environmental remediation cleanup. That to me is very important. This isn't BP that will, or Exxon that will come out and have the financial resources to, uh, resources to clean this up. I sincerely believe this is the type of company that will walk away uh, and go on to the next operation. That's it. So please, questions. Yeah, that's um, great information. Um, a couple of things. The the oil spill response the 12.6 million gallons um who has regular regulatory authority to set that level is that deq the answer to that question is i i don't think that is actually uh i have i can't say i've asked the deq that question but I think what you will find is the DEQ will simply look at their spill response plan and ask the question, 
is it, is it a responsible plan? And the answer to the question before Zenith, from everything that I've read and I've gone through and looked at the analog of the spills, the answer is yes. But what I would ask the question of DEQ is the size of the potential uh, spill has increased dramatically. So that's why, and it's, and it's in your backyard, our backyard. So that's the question that uh, I wouldn't be afraid to ask that question to DEQ, but I think, and, they all, I think they look at the spill response plan for thoroughness and approach and, and equipment. Right. And I think what, what would uh, help make our case for requiring more would be, you know, it, are there, what are the other standards in the other states? You know, like, you know, Texas or Louisiana, you know, what do they, or, or any Michigan for that matter, I mean, what do the uh, other states require in terms of spill response preparedness? And, you know, as a benchmark, you know, and, and, and the fact that, that actually, and, and I posted in the chat, the, the storage volumes for the other terminals, I mean, that 12.6 million gallons, just quickly calculating, that only represents 3% of the total capacity of all the terminals. So, you know, and, and I think there's a case to be made that in a major sub subduction zone earthquake, where you have multiple failures up and down the river, um, I don't think anybody thinks 3% is going to cut it. I, I would agree completely. The thing I would point out too, people tend to focus on the subduction zone, but that hill to the west of Zenith Energy a few hundred feet away is a major transpressional fault. And so there's activity along that. So the biggest risk there is it's not going to take a six or a seven to, to crack those tanks. And that's the type of earthquake that will happen from a smaller transpressional fault that would trigger that. And it's a few hundred feet away and then the epicenter will be shallow and close by. Right. But you've got to realize that the states of Texas and Louisiana don't have the earthquake liquefaction zones that, that, that we have. So, well, can, or for that matter, you know, Washington or California might be more equivalent um, states. Right. And, and we've been looking to California a little bit in terms of what California has been requiring in terms of seismic upgrades for the storage tanks. Right. Well, the storage up tank uh, reference I put on the, there is actually a US EPA recommended uh, tank requirements. Again, recommended is a key word. So they, and from that, the EPA is saying, this is what we recommend, but we've got to recognize it depends on where you are. So that doesn't mean you can't implement their recommendation, especially in a site with as risky as this. But right. And I guess that was my next sort of set of questions around the berming. And we were talking about this before is again, sort of, you know, my understanding is you got to you got to be able to contain the largest tank on the site. How does that standard compare to other state standards in terms of? Yeah, if you look at that picture of the Chevron three tanks that are next to each other, there's one large central tank and there are two smaller tanks and all three are have berms from that standpoint. If you're talking about Louisiana and refineries that I'm aware of, all tanks, regardless of, as long as they're over, like I say, 55 gallons, all fuel storage tanks, whether crude oil or refined crude oil, have uh, berms. Uh, there, their risk is hurricanes, and they're worried about destruction or something coming in, puncturing or clutching, and then the oil getting out, or worst case, then flooding, as they had uh, the hurricanes come down there, hit New Orleans. Uh, Texas has similar concerns, but their hurricane frequency and intensity typically is less than New Orleans, where it has been so far. Um, all right, well, let's see what we can find from that. But I, I think you're right if you, if you look at 
states like California. Um, now the the question is, I'm not sure if they still if they still they must have import terminals for biofuel because that's a growing market and that's a market that Zenith is particularly targeting. Okay. Um, because a lot of the oil that is in the um, Kern County area that is actually shipped now over to the five refineries in Utah. Um, hmm. Because the <laughs> exporting it to a refining a refinery that wants to take that, it's easier to get it to Utah, even if it had means, I don't know if the pipeline system set up, I know the rails are, go over to Utah because they've got the refineries there and they've got um, less restrictions the state of California has. But they must have fuel import terminals um, in California. So yeah, let me see what if we can dig into something like that um, for the state of California. The city of Long Beach would be a good place to look because they've been pumping oil out of the ground forever down there. And they've got, I'm sure, a lot of tankage uh, in that vicinity. And they're right on the water. Um, so that uh, might be a good place yeah. to probe around. Yeah, that, that's uh, wherever the export terminal is, that would be where it would be. So it would be both an import and an export terminal. That's a good, good idea, Bob. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Well, the um, the the imposing the dollar a gallon surcharge on on fuel exports um, is there an interstate commerce clause issue with that? That's the one thing I'm not aware of. I think as if 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 you get into the state water into the riverway, the international riverway. Then the answer is you've got a different. That's a different. There's a line of demarcation between the rivers, and and the ground. Okay, but I think as long that's that is a critical question. I haven't confirmed that. I was going to go follow up with DEQ on that particular issue, so I can follow up with that as well. That's because the one that's that with our. Um, terminal storage tank capa capacity regulations, that's, that was a key issue. It probably will come back as a key issue um, that we were somehow um, impermissible uh, regulation of interstate commerce. We, we prevailed the first time around all the way up to the Oregon Supreme Court, but when we readopt these regulations, I would imagine um, we're going to have to argue that again. Right. Now, the key question is, <laughs> get semantics, but with attorneys, that's an important component. The question is whether you assess it for every gallon of fuel you store or export. If you get the export and then all of a sudden, then you may open the door for uh, limitations. But on the storage side, then I think you've got your you're within the right zone of authority. <laughs> yeah. And and that's I think that's how we prevailed is that our storage capacity regulations applied to all types of terminal. We're not we're not regulating the flow. Right. Um, you know, Zenith is the only one that is really exporting, or in Portland at least, is exporting right. material. Right out of state, the others are all importing it to serve the state, but there's nothing in our rules right now that wouldn't prevent any of them from, you know, reversing the, the flow and becoming an export terminal. Right, I look at it as the same approach as the, the county, I think it was the county assessed the gasoline tax. Uh, we have a county and a city and a state gasoline tax, yeah. Right, right. The one that was um, passed, one that was passed most recently in, in was it a year and a half or a year ago? Uh, that's a city, city, city tax. Okay. Yeah, I think um, we have looked at that. Um, it, Oregon has some, uh, a un, 
unique constitutional issue with gas taxes is that all gas tax revenue has to go towards roads. Okay. Um, and I forget, you know, if we're doing all fuels for storage, um, whether that that same clause applies to would apply to this as well. Well, the, the key thing is when you assess one dollar per gallon, you've just added forty two dollars a barrel to the the uh, price. So that basically makes the export import and export no longer economic. Okay. Right. You put the berm in there, you have more spacing between the tanks, the volume decreases. So their storage capacity decreases, their, their cost uh, increases. So they'll, they came here because they saw a window of opportunity to uh, skid, shall we say, skid underneath the uh, regulations and um, shall we say, be less than transparent. Yeah. Um, what I don't know, you know, is, you know, this, the, the 1.5 million barrels or, 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 you know, the 63 million gallons that they have storage there. Um, I don't have a good handle on how many, how many of those tanks are active. How many are are um, what what's the phrase? They're not in use or not in service, and I would I would suspect that that a lot of those smaller tanks are not in service. Um, I suspect most of those tanks because they're not actively operating right now. I suspect most of that fuel is fuel tanks are empty. Okay? Right. Right. That's why when I've talked about this, we talk, I've talked about their fuel capacity, which is another thing, whether they are full or empty, okay? Because the only way they can make money or the way they get their margins is volume and margin, okay? And <clears throat> you shrink that, the ability for them to store the quantity, and you also basically say, whether you've got your tanks full or empty, uh, here's the charge. Jack, are you, are you able to send us a copy of your presentation? Absolutely, be my pleasure. I'll send it to you uh, very shortly. We can send you the PowerPoint. Uh, yeah. yeah, we could also send the, uh, uh, the recording. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't start the recording exactly at the beginning, but pretty close to the beginning. So uh, we can send it to you also. That'd be great too, I'd appreciate that. Very good. Any other questions, gentlemen? So, you know, what are the city's next steps? You're doing. You have that uh, county uh, study underway. I just wondered how you plan to proceed on this. Um, what are your What are your goals? Yeah. So the the storage tank zoning regulations, you know, were appealed for a second time. Um, we were remanded by the, the Land Use Board of Appeals for some technical findings. Um, we're hoping to readopt those in February, mm -hmm. and we would expect another appeal by the, by the um, Western States Petroleum Association and, and others. Um, where the, the city is working with the county on that risk assessment, that report is supposed to be done soon. And then once that report is adopted, then we would, um, I would expect that we would sort of move forward with the county and figuring out um, how to require risk bonding. Um, 
Again, I would expect a legal challenge saying that we don't have the authority to do that. Uh, we expect in February, we have uh, what's called a short, short two month session of the Oregon legislature. And we have a Senator from Portland that uh, I think is introducing a bill that would uh, require the seismic upgrades um, to the, you know, that either directs the state uh, building official or authorizes the city to require more, more um, seismic upgrades. And then that would kick off a, a rulemaking process and a yeah. timeline for seismic upgrades probably over the next 10 years. Is, is that Representative Dexter out of third District 33? Um, she has, she's actually a, re yeah, a representative. She is, uh, um, expressed interest. Um, it's Senator Dembro. Oh, okay. um, in 2019, he introduced a similar bill and, uh, he's interested in, in bringing that back this session. Um, because it's the short session, uh, each uh, elected official is only allowed two bills. Right, right. And so I don't know, I haven't heard how Dembro and Dexter are working together on this okay. issue. We've given a presentation to uh, one of the aid for Senator Dexter, or Representative Dexter, uh, and uh, she apparently has keen interest in this. Obviously, uh, a spill or a fire or an explosion would impact her district, uh, perhaps more than any other district in the metro area. Yeah. Um, so those those are the the sort of I guess short term issues. I, I mean we're we're expecting on uh, in late December, early January, we're expecting the Luba decision on the the appeal of the Zenith land use compatibility statement. Um, denial. Um, so that issue will pop back up and, and we'll, we'll see. Um, you know, I know, I know the city attorneys were pretty pessimistic, just based more on land use grounds. Um, I read their brief, I thought they made a pretty good case for it. But, uh, you know, we'll see. Right. No, I understand. It's, uh, there's uncertainty in all of this. I'm curious about one factor. I've read that the state, uh, Governor Brown instituted well, two, maybe three years ago, a one or $2 fee on oil that's imported to the state. And I think it was targeting by rail, rail, fuel, rail fuel cars. But I haven't found much detail on that. You know that I, am not as familiar with. Okay. Because it, it, it kind of rings a bell that they, you know, that that, you know, especially after the the oil train spill in Mosier, right. Oregon. Right. That there was some activity to, you know, increase our our spill response. Um, but I I don't know the what that is about off the top of my head. Yeah, I, I think at the time they were concerned about the oil being shipped down from Alberta uh, by train from the tar sands because Al the tar sands right now are landlocked because British Columbia has got a ban. Um, they can't ship it out of uh, Washington. They can't ship it out of California. The pipelines don't want it because it just plugs up the pipeline and every time they plug it up, they have to shut it down and take the pipeline. They can't ship it east. Um, so yeah, this was the um, <laughs> golden path for Zenith to start use, uh, getting a market for this uh, oil in uh, Alberta. Okay, all right, that's good. All right, we'll, uh, we'll do some, we've got some homework to do and I, I will send you, um, Kyle, I've got your email. And if you wouldn't mind, if I don't have Tom's on the last email, if you would send it to him as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll forward everything to Tom. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, I can I can stick mine in the in the chat. Okay, thank you very much. You're going to send us a link to that preliminary report on 
On, yeah, uh, it's in it's oh. in the chat. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And and like I said, um, the the final version of that report should be coming out soon. Okay. Good.